Hi, folks. Welcome to Politico's weekly podcast. I'm Deputy Breaking News Editor Jed Roche. Uh, this week, this week's topic is focusing on the MH17 plane crash that happened in Ukraine near the Russian border on Thursday. Uh, today, we have uh, Burgess Everett, Congress reporter. We've got Jonathan Topaz, breaking breaking news reporter. Hadas Gold, media reporter, and Dan Berman, the White House editor. Welcome, guys. Hey, it's good to be here. So, uh, I guess we will. We will start out with Dan here. Uh, I think uh, the biggest development that we've seen uh, recently was uh, Barack Obama speaking uh, earlier on Friday on uh, 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 addressing the crash and what had happened. Uh, what did we learn from Barack Obama speaking? We learned that the White House is ready to do everything but blame Vladimir Putin directly. You know, the, the president drew this roadmap. He said, all right, well, we know the rocket was you know, a ground-to-air missile. We know it came from parts of Ukraine that were held by separatists. We know that separatists have talked about uh, shooting down other planes recently. We know that they wouldn't have the technology on their own. We know that they've been getting support from Russia. What he didn't say was Vladimir Putin has blood on his hands, but it was clear to anybody who was listening where this is going. Mm -hmm. And, and I think uh, you, you, you heard even uh, stronger reactions from folks on the Hill, especially uh, a lot of congressional Republicans, Republican senators. I know from when we were watching on the breaking news desk, when we were watching television, you know, John McCain was one of the first people out and uh, as well as uh, Senator Kelly Ayotte was talking about how she saw uh, Vladimir Putin's fingerprints all over this. Burgess, uh, you were on the Hill. Can you tell us an idea, uh, uh, some, some of the uh, feedback you're hearing from members of Congress uh, in the wake of what happened? You know, the interesting thing, about these uh, sort of if conclusions where people are saying if it was indeed from these Russian separatists, mm. then Vladimir Putin has blood on his hands. Is This isn't based on any information that we don't have right. uh, because John McCain uh, came out of this intelligence briefing on Thursday and he said, I'm not telling you anything from this intelligence briefing. Then went six minutes on uh, why it was Putin's fault, right. I if it was Putin's fault, essentially. Uh, and, and that's kind of the pattern you're seeing from most members is uh, most members who are, who are kind leaping ahead of the president uh, they're saying you know qualifying everything they say with well we don't have all the details yet but it sure looks like it was Putin's fault and he's gonna have hell to pay for this right. uh, and John McCain has been the loudest on this because he's been doing a, a ton of media over the past uh, a couple days and seems to be the go-to guy whenever uh, uh, foreign affairs cranks up into the yeah. the media spectrum. Yeah, very much so. Uh, and it, I, I think it's funny, it wasn't uh, yesterday afternoon, we were also talking about Biden, whether or not he had said apparently that the plane had been uh, shot out of the sky. I think that was another uh, interesting sort of take on it, where it was like, who who is actually, uh, whether or not we had actually confirmed that uh, what had happened to the plane, uh, I think. Yeah, uh, I mean, Biden was a, you know, a, it's essentially an hour or so ahead of, you know, the news cycle there. Right. You know, we, you know, pretty quickly you had, you know, U.S. you know officials and always always those anonymous officials seem to know everything that's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, they <laughs> said, all right, well, the plane has been shot down. You know, today the president uh, went further and, you know, we'll definitely learn more as this uh, goes on. Or, at the very least, people will be willing to say more right. as this goes on. Right, and people briefed on this stuff, classified briefing almost entirely on the plane on Thursday afternoon would not go as far as these anonymous officials. So uh, I'm not sure if we're seeing another problem with the pipeline between the White House and Congress or if uh, if they just didn't want to say or weren't 100% sure. But uh, it was interesting to me that sort of disconnect. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned uh, John McCain. Who are, who are some of the other people around the Hill that are, that you're looking for, or if if other people were reading the news that you think would really have some idea, some better idea, or some sort of inside scoop uh, in terms of the developments that are coming out of this? Obviously, a lot of this is going to be very classified information. But are there are there specific members of Congress who you think have a a better idea? Uh, of what's going on and are also at the same time going to be willing to talk to the media. I mean, I think that there are members who think they have a better <laughs> idea <laughs> of what's going case. on. I, I mean, you would look at uh, uh, basically the people that have been dealing with intelligence and defense issues uh, for years. So you'd be looking at Dianne Feinstein on the Intelligence Committee. You'd be looking at Saxby Chambliss on the Intelligence Committee. McCain, who served on the Armed Services Committee, is one of the senior members there. And also Carl Levin from Michigan, who's the chairman. Uh, and also, uh, you got to look at congressional leadership they've been pretty quiet uh Boehner put out a, John Boehner, the House Speaker, put out a statement, um, you know, saying this was a tragedy. But you know, nobody is really 
blaming Obama yet. Right. And I, I would be looking to see whether people with heft in Congress do eventually point the finger at the president's foreign policies as sparking this. Yeah. I was going to ask if anyone is already seeing uh, much of a, 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 a partisan divide, and anybody can hop in on this one, uh, as far as, you know, I, I think we you see the usual calls for Obama's leadership. You know, I think it was Pete King was one of the first ones to say, uh, you know, we're looking for more leadership from the president. But it, it from an outsider's perspective, perspective, it doesn't look like there's much of a partisan divide just yet. Um, do you think this will that this will eventually tie into you know a broader political narrative that Republicans draw about Obama as a leader? I definitely think it will be. I mean, we already saw people comparing it, what how Obama didn't come out to speak the day of, especially mm -hmm. when he went out campaign, not campaigning, fundraising or right. doing you know kind of lighthearted speeches right after they were coming out to the eighty three. Uh, shoot down of the of the when Russia shut down a passenger plane when I think Reagan the day of came out very very quickly against it granted this is a different time it was Cold War mm -hmm. um, that type of thing but they're saying this we're, we're all they're pretty much saying we're kind of in the same situation um, this is coming from a lot of conservative media folks bloggers and talk show hosts and the like and they say again like where is Obama on this one they so I have seen some people go so far as saying like if we had fixed or if we had stepped in the situation in Ukraine this would not have happened mm -hmm. um, but I think it's it's still right now a bit of a stretch for people to point the finger yeah I think it's harder particularly because he offered sanctions the day before this happened. Uh, and I think that the president can point to Europe as being somewhat unwilling partners given their relative dependence on Russia for oil and gas. I also think that's a little hard for some members of Congress to criticize the president given the fact that it would be something of a rhetorical play because ultimately it's a fairly war-weary public and they don't really have interest in m something much further than what the president might be offering. So similar to what you've seen in debates about Iraq, which have been largely semantic or rhetorical, um, people are, would generally probably be offering similar solutions. I think it can be easy to, to draw conclusions that about what everyone in Congress is thinking uh, when these foreign uh, uh, crises hit because you just hear a lot of the same voices on every single one of them mm -hmm. and they're loud and they're everywhere the Pete Kings the John McCain's of the world uh, you, so you know the people that disagree with them they're not gonna put them on TV to spread the message of hey guys uh, hold up here I mean because yeah. it's just not as interesting to people so uh, I think it's uh, there's you can draw broad conclusions from a couple members of Congress and and it may not reflect the entire body. Well, that uh, that uh, that actually brings me to my next point as far as uh, Dan or uh, anyone does who who's going to be the person that really brings the Obama's perspective for or is there any uh, this weekend I guess we don't know exactly who's going to be on all the Sunday shows but like who would be the kind of voices that Obama would have out uh, I guess getting his side of the uh, his side of this issue out there if he if it's not just himself speaking. Uh, well, obviously, he has his uh, cabinet members. He has mm -hmm. Secretary of State uh, John Kerry, for instance, who was you know, involved in a lot of the diplomacy early on, um, you know, with Ukraine, um, you know, and obviously has dealt with uh, Putin on other issues, uh, such as uh, what was going on in Syria last year. Um, so, you know, he's got, you know, um, you know, voices to 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 help out. I think people are really waiting to see you know, kind of how, you know, concrete any evidence is, uh, you know, regarding Russian involvement, regarding the separatist involvement here. They're also waiting to see kind of how they handle the aftermath. Um, you know, the plane obviously was shot down in uh, areas controlled by the separatists. If it turns out they start blocking an investigation, if they, you know, don't turn over the black boxes, if, you know, they start making it difficult to, you know, to find the evidence that people are looking for, then you're going to see more and more of that anger. That point about uh, Europe's involvement, that was one of the reasons why it took so long to, you know, until Wednesday to announce those new sanctions against uh, Putin. And... President Obama, in his uh, remarks uh, today, was very clear, saying this has to be a wake-up call to Europe. And you had, you know, most of the citizens on the uh, flight were uh, European, and the idea that now that you know they can't ignore what's happening here, um, just because it was convenient for them um, economically. Obviously, they're afraid of any. Um, 
a retaliation from Putin. But, you know, he's basically saying, and Hillary Clinton said uh, as well, Europe needs to step up. It's, you know, it's in their backyard. It's easy for the U.S. to call for sanctions and do that sort of thing. But we're not going to be able to do anything substantial without Europe's involvement. And if Europe doesn't step up, Putin's not going to be uh, cowed by any uh, rhetoric. Mm. And are we seeing much of a, Jonathan, I think we come from a more general assignment sort of background, you know, with breaking news, uh, I think, w which involves a lot of uh, looking at uh, getting information from all sorts of sources. What kind of, uh, if any, uh, international responses have you seen over the covering the story over the past 36 six hours? I think, you know, are there any uh, voices from people either speaking in Europe or uh, from e either of the destinations or uh, or what? Or what's Vladimir Putin saying? What are just some of the inter international voices you're hearing outside the yeah, U.S.? Yeah, well, well, Vladimir Putin. I don't think you're gonna hear too much. He didn't uh, rule out that it was a pro-Russian separatist. He's a very skilled statement maker, uh, but he uh, put the blame on Ukraine, uh, which is which is not too surprising. He also hasn't accepted uh, that. Syrian President Bashar Assad used chemical weapons on his own people, so I don't think we're really going to expect much upfront from him on this issue if it turns out that the evidence suggests uh, pro-Russian separatists. Um, I do think that the pivotal player internationally, uh, as it is for most EU issues, is going to be Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany. She and uh, Putin have something of a personal relationship. And Germany is obviously the political and economic power player in Europe, uh, which is in the EU is, of course, hurting economically. Uh, she spoke with Putin on uh, Thursday evening. On Friday morning, she released a statement saying that uh, any talk of sanctions was f too premature until we get more uh, information. But again, I do think that moving forward, as Dan said, the EU is, is going to play a really pivotal part as to whether these sanctions are going to hurt or not if they do, in, in fact, increase sanctions. And there's no one better to look for in the future than um, Angela Merkel on that. Hadass, uh, as a skilled media watcher, can you tell me, I, I, I'm just always amazed at how quickly everyone loses their attention with uh, foreign <laughs> incidents. How long are we going to be talking about this plane? My estimate is that by Monday, uh, we will definitely see a drop down. You know, you'll see CNN will continue it because CNN with plane crashes is like a moth to light and they can't stay away. But you're going to see the other outlets start changing tune a little bit and, and moving away from it for the most part because it's, it's kind of sad to think about it, but because there were so few Americans on board. Um, and because we kind of, everybody, it seems like we kind of know what happened already and everything that's going to come from this is going to be political fallout. And if it doesn't affect Americans directly, if it's not like the border crisis where, you know, people live in those areas, they know people f who live in those areas, they're, uh, they're seeing these busloads of children come up. That's more in their literal backyard than a plane crash in a war torn area where I think the only the only time we're going to see people we're going to see the media start paying attention to it is if we actually get more involved. So border story has more legs, you think? <laughs> I think I think the border story has more legs also because this weekend we're going to see the like, you know, Glenn Beck is going to go on down there with all of his semi trucks and give out teddy bears and food to the children down there. We're going to see Ted Cruz today just announced that he from your story that he's going to go down there and and tour the area. And I think that's going to bring the attention back and this isn't like the plane that disappeared like i said we know what happened um and they will lose focus although plane crashes tend to have a little bit of a longer span in the news just because they are just so fascinating and this one is just has the added element that seems like it's out of a movie literally i saw a tweet the other day that was like the world this week is like a bad model un or like the craziest model un any kid has ever gone to it's there's just so much going on around the world right now that the already add media is just like having a field day going back and forth through everything yeah well along those same lines i can't tell if it's just because i'm paying particularly close attention to this plane crash but it seems like a lot of the coverage coming out of it is just going into very graphic detail uh, about the wreckage in particular yeah. i mean i just feel like i've seen like just some really 
crazy vivid headlines in regards to uh, just describing the scene. And I was wondering if this scene, that if the coverage of this, maybe because it was in such a politically charged area, uh, if you had any like feedback or thoughts on if uh, if there was you know if the how the coverage of this particular plane crash is different than. Uh, some of the other ones that well, we've seen recently. Well, what's really interesting is, you know, now that everybody, even the people in middle of nowhere, eastern Ukraine, have smartphones, we immediately had video of this, and we immediately had photographs of it. And we're not saying, and this isn't like in the United States where uh, police would immediately go corn this off. It would just be, you know, professionals sweeping this. You had everyday villagers going in, taking pictures and seeing things. Um, and there were there were reporters who were in Donetsk already covering the conflict who were able to get there really quickly. And they just walked right up to the wreckage site and started describing what was happening. And because of the way the plane came down, because it was a missile fire, some pieces of the plane are totally intact. And it's it's strange and people are just look as though they're just laying there and other people are completely charred. And and I think this is this always brings up the ongoing debate of how should the media handle situations like these. Um, I know that the Wall Street Journal immediately started tweeting out photos that were very graphic of bodies at the record site and a lot of people were angry at them for not editing them or for not giving some kind of warning because it just shows up on your feed on Twitter you can't really control it um, but the the attend I mean it, it's one of those like you can't not look situations exactly. and I think that unlike the previous plane Malaysian plane, plane crash there is so much visual to use in TV especially such a visual medium and online everything is now visual the fact that we have these details just makes it so much more it hits closer to home especially when you see the passports when you see the tour books you know that people had and they're they're intact it looks like nothing has happened to them you're used to plane crashes where everything is destroyed and this isn't the case yeah no I think it's a very interesting point particularly with Twitter uh, how there isn't really a filter there uh, in terms of you know if you have if you have access to a smartphone and the internet you can upload pictures almost immediately uh, and I and we're gonna continue that conversation in just one second uh, but we're gonna take a quick break uh, for some programming notes uh, for, for, with more from Burgess Everett Jonathan Topaz Dan Berman and Hadas Gold and uh, we'll be right back Hey, podcast listeners, uh, a couple things to put on your plate. The first is a campaign pro luncheon briefing. That is on Monday at 12 p.m. Join members of the campaign pro team for an interactive d discussion about who is up, who is down, and what to expect for the 2014 midterm elections and also implications for 2016. That's right. We're talking 2016 here at Politico. And on Tuesday... July 22nd in New York City, we have Politico, Google, and the Tory Perch Foundation are presenting Women Rule, Women and Capital, Earning It, Raising It, and Giving It. That is at 9 a.m. on Tuesday in New York City. For more information, check out politico.com slash events. <clears throat> Both events will stream live at politico.com slash live. Now back to the show. And we're back. Uh, we are going to just continue our discussion regarding uh, uh, media coverage and the plane crash of MH17. Uh, I was just talking to Hadas about, uh, you know, all of our reporters were glued to the TV yesterday uh, uh, on Thursday uh, when it happened. Uh, and uh, some unfortunate developments befell uh, MSNBC while they were covering the crash. Uh, Hadas, can you take us a little bit through what happened? Yeah, if you talk about a cringeworthy moment, this is definitely up there. Um, MSNBC... They weren't. They didn't change their lineup for covering the breaking news, so they were on to the cycle, the show where four people, um, kind of four pundits, sit around a table and discuss things. And Crystal Ball was taking a call. Where they actually cut away from a congressman to talk to a what they said was an MSNBC exclusive, who they said was a uh, military guy, a staff sergeant at the embassy in the U.S. embassy in Ukraine, who had seen the plane crash. That already is a red flag because the U.S. embassy in the Ukraine is in Kiev, which there's no way you could see the plane getting hit from Kiev. Um, and immediately he gets on the phone. He says something along the lines of, you know, yeah, I was looking out the window and I saw so what looked like a projectile hit the plane and it seemed to have come from Howard Stern ass. And Crystal apparently didn't get the joke. And she she says, can you use your military experience to somehow describe or or, you know, continues going on like, please use your military oh, experience. And then, <laughs> and then he just says, well, you're a dumbass, aren't you? Yeah, I, I was watching, uh, I kept watching it uh, as much as I could on the 
uh, replay system that we have here, uh, and it was just it's very it's very cringeworthy, cr cringeworthy, uh, and I think it uh, certainly shows the perils of live TV. I think uh, also as you were pointing out earlier. Uh, you know, Crystal Ball isn't necessarily a breaking news anchor. Right. I mean, it's not her fault. It's the fault of whoever the booking person is, the producer is. I mean, there are multiple levels that someone has to get through in order to get a call into a network like that and get live on air. Multiple people had to approve this. So I have a feeling a few heads are going to roll at MSNBC. But poor Crystal Ball also that she had to be suffer from this. But MSNBC is in a weird spot because they're not made for breaking news situations like these. Like this is when CNN shines. CNN has the resources all over the world. It has reporters everywhere. It has people that are well trained in doing these breaking news situations and they have multiple options. On MSNBC, they're the place for politics. Yeah. They're the place for sitting around and pundits and things like that. And the sad thing I think is that they don't they just they try to be cover these breaking news situations when it's just not their thing but they can't not do it um it's similar to when i think luke resser kicked some congressmen off because lebron james was announcing that he yeah. was going back to cleveland and i sometimes question why don't they just put in some of their people that could be breaking news anchors put in andrea mitchell put in chuck todd even Luke Russert yeah. could like just sit there all day and and do the breaking news anchoring versus trying to go. Th I mean, when Al Sharpton is trying to like anchor like breaking news coverage, it's just awkward. Yeah, it's, it seems like it's a, sort of a very strange dynamic. I know that uh, all of us here have had to watch a lot of live television for our jobs, uh, you know, particularly the news. Uh, have any of you guys seen anything like what happened on MSNBC. Well, this brings back, uh, for uh, some of us who remember, the OJ chase is the classic, um, because that involved uh, you know, Howard Stern as well. I it think was, I was nine. Uh, there you go. I mean, during, during the chase, uh, I think Peter Jennings and Al Michaels were on the air. Is a pretty uh, well-known story, and you know somebody called in, um, you know, and they you know went on for a while, and then you know they said you know shouted out Baba Booey, and Al Michaels <laughs> got it, uh, Peter Jennings uh, didn't quite get it immediately, and you know eventually you know the call was cut off, um, you know, but that was live television when you know millions of people were watching and the country was captivated. You know, here, I don't know what the audience for MSNBC was um, you know, yesterday, but it was kind of the same idea of, look, it's live television. Mm -hmm. You know, people, you know, will try and get through and, you know, everybody, you know, they want to get on the air and, you know, make fools out of themselves. And, <laughs> you know, sometimes they get through right. and, you know, the sort of thing, you know, is going to happen. I think Hadas makes a good point. What matters is how the on-air talent deals with. Um, this type of thing and it was clear crystal ball didn't quite hear the second part of the, the original sentence yeah. um, I mean, I'm about where this missile emerged yeah i'm surprised he word. didn't get cut off right there they right. kept right. him right. on the, the phone somebody <laughs> should have been like all right as soon as you hear the words howard stern like that's it yeah um it makes you wonder if like what what is the situation as far as the msnbc's delay system is because i feel like they they more so than other networks and correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like they're they more so than other uh, networks have gotten in trouble when it comes to the seven second delay where someone is supposed to be able to hit a button uh, only thinking of like the Mark, Hal um, the Mark Halperin incident on Morning Joe a couple of years ago. Um, uh, so I don't know if that's that's entirely fair. But uh, I was going to say, Jonathan, you have to watch a lot of breaking news for, for our team as well. Uh, to Hadassah, Sorry about that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> to, to Hadassah's point about uh, CNN, do you feel like uh, they are still like the when uh, you know they got a lot of flack? I think for their coverage of the of the uh, mi the first missing Malaysian airline. Uh, do you still feel like though that they're the place to go or where everyone turns when there is that sort of like breaking news event? Like what t what TV channel do you want to be watching if you think there's some sort of like breaking global development? I, I suppose. Um I think it's an exceptionally difficult job to cover a huge breaking story when there's very limited information and to do it on live television in a 24-7 news environment. It can be very difficult. We as reporters have the ability to wait and see how things play out without having to be in front of a camera. And so I think for as much as people like to rag on television media, I think maybe they deserve a little bit of credit. I find it to be an exceptionally difficult task, particularly there is such little information for the first at least several hours, even yeah. you could argue the first day uh, of the plane crash. There's still only really conjecture about whether this might have been separatist, whether this, the plane might have been shot out of the sky. Um, but I do think that CNN has a bit of an authority more so than... Um, 
Fox News and MSNBC, certainly, I think, as Sadas said, uh, having those bureaus all across the world um, gives them a sense of credibility. And I do think that they uh, can stay with a story and have some interesting voices as it is. But I think ultimately what you've seen in, in covering the story also is that television has, has learned to slow down a little bit and to check themselves, particularly after, I think, the Supreme Court decision on the Affordable Care Act. It appears as though the television media is, is maybe becoming a little bit more responsible. And uh, Hadass could speak this better than I could, but it struck me as though the uh, media, particularly on CNN, was 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 quite measured on Thursday when we were still learning a lot about the crash. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't give all the media credit in terms of like checking everything. They just they just need to fill time before they get more information. <laughs> but I do think that CNN showed why it still is around um, yesterday. But I would also point out the broadcast networks all broke into their regular broadcasts and put their best people on um, pretty immediately, and they also have still quite a few bureaus all around and I think that they were also doing pretty good um, reporting around the world and I like ABC stayed on for quite a while they didn't let it go other places kind of did the normal couple hours maybe an hour but ABC kept going for, for I think they were the last ones off of the broadcast networks all right so obvious question for you why doesn't MSNBC just take the NBC news feed where and clearly they have the best people on the main network. Right. I mean, I think part of it is that NBC doesn't want to be associated with MSNBC, <laughs> honestly. Um, they've already started to kind of break away where they're not, I think their websites aren't even necessarily as linked as they used to be. Um, and it's, it's a very valid question, but I guess for them, I'm sure there are rules against what they can take and can't take. And Well, particularly, I think in the, uh, the, the instance, uh, it's just, it just shows that conflicting dynamic that there is the pressure to have the CNN level uh, tw- 24-hour news that's there. And I feel like even, uh, you know, Fox News has a slightly better handle right. on on being able to cut into that kind of stuff. And because MSNBC has kind of become more of, as, as you're pointing out, like the talking sort of pundit sort of uh, t- uh, uh, channel, it just is not in the same format when it comes to uh, when it comes to yeah uh, Fox News has still has a better connection to their I guess they're like affiliates into um, their they don't really have the same type of broadcast network like NBC CBS or ABC does but they tend to have more of a connection to them than MSNBC does to NBC you know and I would I would also just add it's not only the TV networks that feel pressure to, to fill the, the uh, air. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> as soon as this plane crashed, uh, our team got an email that said, you know, there's intense interest in this, and you guys got to figure out what members of Congress have to say. Well, they don't know what the heck's going on, but they're going to say something anyway because they want to be quoted, and they want to sound like smart people on the subject, even if we don't know anything. Yeah, do you think uh, members of Congress, in, in a completely cynical way, maybe not as deliberate, but, like, have essentially, like, a template for each sort of, like, different kind of world disaster in terms of responding you know in terms of like you know uh uh they just know uh if it seems like something that is remotely related to terrorism there's you know the kind of members of congress that you're going to sure i mean look at uh you know first you look at this it's we're naturally kind of uh, at odds with Russia, right? And always ha- have been since the Cold War. Uh, so it's very easy to put out a statement casting some blame towards them. Just as when we see um, uh, Israel going into Hamas, we see everybody standing with Israel. They don't have any new information to add, but they sure want you to know that they're on Israel's side. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys very much all for uh, coming out. Uh, now we've reached the shout out round, uh, where everybody uh, has uh, something that they want to uh, give a shout out to. Uh, so we'll we'll go quickly around the table, starting with you, Burgess. Is there what would you like to shout out this week? I'm gonna shout out the uh, Washington Wizards for probably getting 90 of my dollars because I'm gonna have to buy a Paul Pierce jersey <laughs> at this point. <laughs> and how about you, Jonathan? Well, I was going to shout out the New York Knicks, who, who very rarely have good news and, and had some good news this summer. But um, I suppose I will give a shout out to my brother, who is moving down to the Beltway. He's moving to Baltimore very soon. Another, topaz. Another yeah. topaz will be in the Beltway, so it's very, very exciting. And uh, yeah. yeah, That's a different Beltway, though. Uh, a different Beltway, but a, <laughs> belt, a Beltway nonetheless. <laughs> what's bringing him to Baltimore? Uh, what's bringing him to, beltway, uh, to Baltimore is uh, he and his wife are moving and uh, both have new jobs, and uh, they're settling down in Baltimore. How exciting. You'll have to find, I guess, Old Bay seasoning or something. 
other Baltimore. I'll just send him a Baltimore care package. <laughs> that was the best I could come up with. <laughs> Natty Bo. Yeah, there we go. Something like that. Um, Burger cookies and the like. That sounds uh, that sounds appropriate. Uh, quickly, Hadass, save me. What I- what's your what's your <laughs> shout out? <laughs> I would like to shout out the Polar vo- Vortex for letting us sleep last so night without awesome. air conditioning. Oh, yeah. Um, it's it's a little bit weird and frightening, and I'm a, wor- a little bit worried for our planet, but I'm enjoying it nonetheless. Yeah, gotta love that frosty 81 degrees outside. And yeah. la- uh, Dan, what what do you have for your shout out this week? Uh, I want to shout out to North Korea. Congratulations for winning the World Cup. Uh, <laughs> I I know it was a hoax uh, article that started it last weekend, but reporting that North Korea was going to play Portugal uh, in the <laughs> final. But I'm assuming North Korea, uh, you know, did really well. They shut out everybody else. <laughs> according to this uh, incredibly valid news report so congratulations that's awesome yeah no, that, that was a really good one uh, and my shout out for this week uh, it's been out for like a week now but uh, out magazine had a great uh, interview and profile of michael sam uh, and a really great sort of like uh, photo spread of like of 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 him and and leading up to uh, the NFL season, uh, it was just very interesting, kind of looking at the different dynamics that are playing uh, uh, as someone who clearly seems to want to be a very private person, but being such a public figure as one of the fir- as the first uh, openly gay player in the NFL. I just thought it was a very interesting profile. So that was from uh, Out Magazine. I can't ima- can't uh, remember who wrote it, but uh, check it out if you Google it. I'm sure you can find it really quickly. Uh, but uh, uh, but Burgess Everett, Jonathan Topaz, Hadas Gold, and Dan Berman, thank you guys very much for coming on to the show. Good job, uh, Dan. Yeah, thank you. If you want <laughs> even if you want even more on on the flight this week, head to Politico.com. You can also find us at uh, Politico.com slash podcast. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Just search uh, Politico Podcast. I'm Jed Roche, and this is the Politico Weekly Podcast. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.